Following on from the success of the Dash 80 prototype, the president of Boeing, William Allen, had a vision that the future of commercial aviation was in jets. In 1952, Boeing gave the go-ahead to commit $16 million in building the Dash 80. That was a huge amount of money back then, which represented nearly all of the profits the company had made since the end of World War II. The strategy that Boeing used was to use the Dash 80 prototype for advertising campaigns that was directed at the public, stressing the comfort and the safety of jet air travel. People were beginning to take an interest in the prototype. Although no orders were made for the plane, it gave Boeing the opportunity to further develop the prototype accommodating the necessary requirements needed for commercial service. Now the Dash 80 led to the commercial 707 and the military KC-135 tanker. Both models shared the same basic design of the Dash 80, but they were very different planes. One great difference was in the width and the length of the fuselage. Airlines wanted a 707 fuselage to be 4 inches wider than the tankers. The width of the 707 made it the largest passenger cabin in the air. The placement of the 100 windows allowed airlines to rearrange their seating configurations. Location of the passenger doors on the left side, at the front and at the rear of the cabin became the standard layout for all Boeing jets. The exterior of the 707 and its competitor the DC-8 were almost identical, but the swept back wings of the 707 meant it could fly about 20 miles per hour faster. Now in just two years, the 707 would help change the way the world travelled. Travelling by air was more fashionable compared to trains and by sea, and the dawn in a new era in travel helped to make the terms Boeing and the 707 more fashionable. But Boeing had a problem, its competitor, the DC-8. Boeing wanted all the attention to be taken away from Douglas, so Boeing custom designed many 707 variants for different customers. The company made special long-range models for Qantas Airways and installed larger engines for high-altitude South American routes. The cost of customising the planes was very high and with every version of the 707, the financial risk also increased. But after a lot of effort and patience, the sales of the 707 started to pick up. The risk had paid off and the 707 outpaced the DC-8 in sales by a considerable margin. Now although the 707s were intended as medium-range transports, they were soon flying across the Atlantic Ocean and across the continents. In total, Boeing had delivered a whopping 1,010 of the 707 model planes. Later on, the 707 was designated the 720 when it was modified for short to medium-range routes and for use on shorter runways. Engineers reduced the fuselage length by 9 feet, they changed the flaps and later installed turbofan engines. But as Boeing continued their research and development on the market, the role of short to medium routes was later filled by the 727 and the 737. The 707 has a cruising speed of 600 miles per hour. It has a range of 3,000 miles and could accommodate up to 180 passengers. The plane is similar to the 737 MAX and the A320neo aircrafts of today. Now the Boeing 707 continues to fly active duty as the KC-135 tanker and the E-3 Sentry in the United States Air Force, as well as other air forces around the world. It also serves smaller cargo airlines and is still flying passengers in Iran. It was hugely popular back in the days, powered by great engineering and design. The cliché, if it ain't Boeing, I ain't going, all started with the Boeing 707. It wasn't the most perfect plane. By today's standards, it was a noisy gas guzzler, but for better or worse, it did change the way we fly. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe for the next episode in the Boeing History Timeline video, the Boeing 717. Sorry, release brakes. Roger. The power is Rotate. Come on, yeah. You're up.